Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Don Lincoln. Don is a senior scientist here at Fermilab and was a member of the teams that discovered both the top quark in 1995 and the Higgs boson in 2012. He's also an avid popularizer, popularizer of science. He has written several books for the public, most recently the one called The Large Hadron Collider. He also writes for many online venues like CNN, Scientific American, and many others. He appears frequently in Fermilab YouTube video channel and has made several video courses through the Great Courses Company. Don is a recipient of the 2013 Outreach Prize for, from the European Physical Society and the 2017 Gamont Award from the American Institute of Physics. He is a fellow of the American Physical so Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So take it away, Don. Welcome to Fermilab. I'm, I'm really very grateful that you're spending your evening with me tonight. Um, and I'd hope to, to give you a very interesting talk about a very interesting topic. The title of my lecture is Knowing God's Thoughts, Einstein's Unfinished Dream. And the picture you he see here is The Creation of Adam by Michelangelo. So I have been asked by more than one person why I titled the talk God's Thoughts, where that seems to be a religious thing and this is, of course, a scientific lecture. Um, but the reason I did that was from a quote from Einstein. Einstein was uh, walking with a young woman by the name of Esther Salomon, and they were talking about a number of things about whether or not she should migrate to a different country, um, their interest in philosophy, um, in learning French, a number of things. But eventually the conversation turned to Einstein's interest in the universe. <clears throat> and he told her basically that he said, I am not interested in this or that phenomena in the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know God's thoughts, the just or just details. So I really like this quote because it's a delightful metaphor, which I think works equally well, whether you are the most devoutly religious person or a staunch atheist. The, the idea that what Einstein was interested in learning and what he wanted to know was none of the specifics, none of the minutia. He wanted to know the reason the universe is the way it is, why the universe has to be the way it is. And that is a fantastic question. It's one that uh, troubled him for all of his life. And in fact, he died, of course, not knowing the answer, but that's what we wanna talk about. What we wanna talk about is Einstein's unfinished dream, which was a quest for a theory of everything. Now, to understand what I mean by a theory of everything, maybe I should give you some idea. So what should a theory of everything be? Well, the first thing it should have is it should identify for us what are the ultimate building blocks of the universe. And by that, I mean the smallest things of which all matter is composed. So if you asked me that question, say, 150 years or so ago, I would say the building blocks of matter are atoms, because that was the smallest component of which we were aware. Um, years later, we learned about protons, neutrons, and electrons. And more recently, we've learned about quarks, which are, are particles that make up protons and neutrons. Um, so now we would say quarks were the building blocks. And we don't think that's the final story. It's just what we know now. So that's the first thing we need to know what are the building blocks of the universe. Now, the building blocks themselves are not enough because we also need to know what holds them together, what governs how they're connected. And for that, we need to understand the forces. I'll talk about a number of forces, but the hope in Einstein's thinking is that when you look at a deep enough level, there is but one force and the force, um, all the forces of which we're familiar is part of a more, more fundamental and basic single force. So we wanna know the building blocks, the forces, and then we wanna dream really, really big. We wanna know how the universe began and how it will end. So when we talk about a theory of everything, we really do indeed mean everything. It's a very ambitious goal and one which um, it, it, is, it consumes the thinking of an awful lot of scientists who are interested in these very, very deep and ancient questions. 
So I'd like to give you a little bit of introduction as to where we are, what we've done, and, and move forward and tell you where we think we'll go and how we'll get there. So let's start out with the, the lessons learned. I've already said some of these things, and the lessons that we've learned thus far is over the years we've realized that bigger things are built from smaller things, and that's a quest towards the ultimate building blocks. Those building blocks are governed by laws, and those laws, um, if you are not careful, they are big and broad, but eventually you realize all of the laws come from deeper and more fundamental laws. And it's been a long time that we've been working on this. One might uh, say that the beginning of modern science is 1543, when Copernicus um, wrote his book on astronomy. So it's been about 500 years that we've been doing this thus far. Now, to just set the tone of what the quest for building blocks is, I'd like to sort of uh, address this picture over here because it gives a sense of how we've journeyed over the years. So the smallest living thing is a virus. Now, my wife who has a biology background will has told me more than once, but Don, you know, virus is not really alive and she's absolutely right, but my, I don't think she's listening tonight. So a virus is the smallest living thing. Um, and the size of it is 10 to the minus seventh meters. So you know how big a millimeter is and a virus, you could put 10,000 viruses side by side within a millimeter, which is really quite tiny. But this is very large on the scale of looking at very fundamental things. Viruses are made of molecules. Molecules are about 100th the size of a virus. Molecules, of course, are made of atoms. Atoms are about the 10th the size of a molecule. We now know that atoms themselves have an interesting structure with a cloud of electrons surrounding a nucleus. The nucleus of an atom is 10 to the minus 14 meters, which means that the nucleus is as small compared to a virus as a virus is compared to us. And so that's incredibly, ridiculously small. And yet the study of the nucleus is something that we explored nearly 100 years ago. The 1930s or so, or maybe even a little earlier, was when the concept of nucleus became clear to us. We have since learned that the nucleus of atoms contains protons and neutrons, which are about one-tenth the size of a nucleus. And in the last 50 years or so, it became obvious to us that inside protons and neutrons are a smaller particle called quarks. Quarks are the, the ultimate building block that we are aware of so far. And if you see here, I say what their size is. There's a little less than sign, and that is five times 10 to the minus 20 meters. So that's one, uh, one 2,000th, no, sorry, 1 20,000th the size of a proton. What does the less than sign mean? Well, what it means is we have looked for quarks to see have a certain size, and we have not seen anything. We have exactly zero evidence that quarks have a size. They could have zero size. In fact, the theory says that they have zero size, and if that's correct, then they are the ultimate building blocks. But as an experimentalist, that's not good enough. What we really know is we know the smallest thing we can see. And so using the most powerful particle accelerator on the planet, we can see things that are about 1 20,000th the size of the proton. And since we can't see a proton size with that uh, apparatus, then that means that the size of a quark, if it has a size at all, is smaller than that. So this is an experimental limit, which is really kind of nice. It tells us where we are. Now, below quarks, well, we don't know if there's anything below quarks. I put this little Here Be Dragons picture because it sort of exemplifies where we are. This is the realm of the unknown. This is where we explore. Now, this is the very small, but I want to remind you what we are attempting to do is we are attempting to do nothing more than explain the universe as a whole. And by the universe, I mean everything. Carl Sagan is reported to have said billions and billions of stars and galaxies. Um, the Milky Way has between 200 and 400 billion stars, and there are at least a trillion galaxies in the visible universe, and, and the, the entire universe is bigger than that. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to explain everything you see in the cosmos. And that is ambitious, and I think I am impressed and indeed humbled by the fact that everything you see out there can be explained by a small number of fundamental subatomic particles. 
So this is what you might call the periodic table of modern science. The periodic table of chemistry, of course, has all of the elements with, the, with which you're familiar. But this is today's modern periodic table. So you have a little pink box, and the pink box contains the quarks. The quarks have really silly names. They are up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom. Um, inside protons and neutrons, you find up and down quarks. The other quarks have um, they exist and we've discovered them. In fact, the top and the bottom quark were both discovered here at Fermilab. Um, but the up and down quarks are the ones that persist in the universe. The others are unstable and decay very rapidly. <clears throat> so think of quarks basically as the nucleus or the things that make up the nucleus of atoms. The leptons, there are two types. There are the bottom row, which are the charged leptons. The most familiar is the electron. So if you take the up and down quark to make protons and neutrons, throw an electron in, you can make atoms, and you can make everything that you see in this picture here. There's also a carbon copy of the electron, the muon, and the tau. Um, those are also unstable particles that exist, but seem to have no significant role in the makeup of the universe on a long-term scale. And then there are the neutrinos, which are ephemeral particles which have nearly no mass, interact hardly at all, and will pass through you, pass through the Earth. And in fact, if you wanted to stop neutrinos from the sun, which is the largest source of, of neutrinos around, you would need five light years of solid lead to, to um, stop half of the neutrinos. I'm not going to talk too much about neutrinos here, but uh, I, I would like to say that the neutrinos have some very interesting mysteries. They've surprised us more than once since they were proposed nearly 100 years ago. And Fermilab is the world's flagship laboratory for studying neutrinos. On the right-hand side, we have the blue things. These are particles that carry forces. Um, and there are four forces, or more or less, and I will explain what I mean by that in a moment. So this, these, this thing here is the closest thing we have to a theory of everything now because using that first leftmost column, we can explain the cosmos. And that is impressive. And if that doesn't make you just a, a little bit, you know, humbled by what it means to be human, I don't know what will. Um, but so here are the building blocks. Let's talk about the forces. So what do we mean by forces? Well, the problem is the word force has, well, many different meanings. There is, of course, military force, which is definitely not what I mean. And then there is perhaps the more fun force of Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi and, and that whole fun movie. But no, scientists, when they talk about forces, they mean something very practical. They're talking about the push and pull that, that you sort of think you understand when you're talking about forces. Now, how many forces are there? What are the forces of which we're familiar? Well, we are familiar with four fundamental forces. And I will tell you in a little bit why the number four is a little bit sketchy and it depends a little on when you ask the question because our understanding improves over time. So the, the most familiar force to everybody is gravitation, simple gravity. You learn about gravity when you are a small child, you take your Cheerios and you drop them over the edge of your high chair to a waiting puppy, you know what gravity is. It makes you fall down, you know, unfortunately gives some of us more weight than we'd like, that's gravity. Electromagnetism is another thing of which we're familiar mostly. Of course, it's electricity and magnetism, but it's also responsible for light and all of chemistry. So those are the familiar forces of the, the, our world around us. But there are two other forces that physicists are aware of. One is the strong nuclear force, and the other is the weak nuclear force. The strong nuclear force holds the nucleus of atoms together, and the weak force is responsible for some forms of radioactivity. So these four forces are what, we, of what we're aware of now. Now I said earlier that I'd like, we'd like in a theory of everything for them to be just one force. So is there some way that we could show that these four forces are one and the same thing? The word that scientists use for this is called unify. How can we unify the forces? Well, unifying forces is a, perhaps a complicated and tricky sounding concept. So I'd like to give you a couple of ideas about unifications that have occurred in the past that maybe you don't even realize that were unifications. So let's start out 
with talking about gravity, not as we understand it now, but as perhaps someone might have understood it around the time of 1600 or so. And in the 1600s, gravity, we did not understand the way we do now. In fact, there were two forms of gravity. There was what we call the terrestrial gravity, the gravity here on Earth that pulls us towards Earth and, and makes these skydivers fall. But there was also the celestial gravity, the gravity that governs the cosmos, that makes the planets march through the sky, makes the sun rise and set, makes the moon also rise and set, makes comets. So there were these two types of gravity. And if you ask someone in the 1600s, there was absolutely no reason to think that these were the same thing. After all, one was in the realm of here on Earth and the other was the realm of the heavens. But it was in the 1670s and 1680s that Sir Isaac Newton came up with his theory of universal gravity, where he came up with a very simple equation that showed that there was just one gravity. The gravity on Earth, celestial, terrestrial gravity, and the gravity in the heavens, celestial gravity, were one and the same thing. They were unified. Two things that seemed different turned out to be the same thing. This is the first example of the unifying forces. Now, there is a more recent version of unification. So when we think about lightning, the, the strike of, of electricity emblazoned across the sky in a storm, it seems to have nothing to do with the force due to magnetism, which might hold your art or your children's art to the refrigerator. They seem to have nothing to do with one another. Electricity doesn't seem to make magnets. Magnets don't seem to make electricity. But it was in the early 1800s that a number of people started seeing linkages between electricity and magnetism. And it was in around the 1870s or so that James Clark Maxwell came up with his Maxwell's equations, which showed that electricity and magnetism were really just one thing, electromagnetism. So here are two cases of unification. And so I'd like to, to sort of show you where the 1960s brought us. So here we have instances of unified forces. So if we were to look on the very rightmost side of the slide, we see that there are six forces, magnetism, electricity, the weak force, the strong nuclear force, and celestial and terrestrial gravity. But because of unifications in the past, we now talk about four forces, electricity and magnetism, the weak force, the strong force, and gravity. And that was true in about the 1960s. However, in the middle 1960s, it became clear that the electromagnetism and the weak force really were one thing electromagnetism, I'm sorry, the electroweak force. And so now we could say that there are in fact three forces, not four. So you see, when I talk about the number of forces, it's a very tricky business because after all, it depends on how well we understand the unification. Now, what's the goal for the future? This is where we are now. The goal for the future is we think, and scientists think that it's possible that maybe the electroweak force and the strong force might be unified into one thing called a grand unified force. And then later, at perhaps a higher energy, this grand unified force, the force of the quantum realm, will be unified with gravity. And we will have a single force called the super force or the theory of everything. So this red is a hope. The, what the, you see in the blue is what we know. The red is, is an aspiration. So we've sort of talked now about the forces. And I want to sort of bring it all together with this picture here, where this is what we might call most of the standard model. And the standard model is the quarks and the leptons, which of course the particles, particles nucleus of atoms, the particles surrounding the outside of atoms, and the force carrying particles. Now, there's one thing missing from this graphic, and that is a force that gives particles their mass. And since this is the most recent unification, I thought I'd spend some time telling, uh, telling you about that. So the standard model predicts that all of those particles, quarks and leptons, are massless. However, in 1964, Peter Higgs and five of his other friends developed a theory that we now call the Higgs field. So that's why Higgs is sort of pulled out to the side as a special person. But it really was all six of these individuals that developed this idea. And in this idea, they proposed that there was an energy field that permeates the entire universe and gives mass to fundamental subatomic particles. And we call this field the Higgs field, and we call the particle 
the Higgs boson. And the thought is, is when the universe began right after the Big Bang, the universe was very, very hot. And when the universe was hot, there was no Higgs field in the universe. And with, when there was no Higgs field in the universe, <clears throat> no particles had mass. So at the very early universe, um, we have this scale here where you have a photon, and the photon, of course, is a massless particle. And you take any particle you like, an electron, a top quark, you name it. And in the early universe, neither of them had mass. But as the universe cooled, the Higgs field turned on, giving mass to some particles, but not photons. So that might seem a little odd to think about a Higgs field turning on, but you're familiar with cases of where the rules of nature change with temperature. For instance, you know what water is, and water has a liquid component to it, but if you cool it at a certain temperature, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees centigrade, the rules change and water becomes ice. There's a transition of the rules of water, which goes from a liquid phase to a solid phase. And a similar thing was thought in the Higgs field that it went from having zero magnitude to having some magnitude. And when it did, particles got mass. Now, I'd like to tell you more about the Higgs uh, mechanism and how it works because it's a fascinating one. Um, but it actually is pretty hard. So I did what you know most people do when they think about that. They, you know, I turned to the internet. And so what I did is I'm going to show you a video about what the Higgs field and Higgs boson is. Um, and it, it's actually much better than anything I could say. So let's watch this video and, and pay attention to the, to the video because the guy who's, who's giving the presentation, he, he really knows his stuff. If you've had any interest in physics at all, you've heard about a thing called the Higgs boson. But just what is it and why is it interesting? In 1964, a physicist by the name of Peter Higgs took some ideas that were floating around at the time, added an insight or two of his own, and proposed that there was an energy field that permeated the entire universe. This energy field is now called the Higgs field. The reason he proposed this field was that nobody understood why some subatomic particles had a great deal of mass, while others had little and some had none at all. The energy field that Higgs proposed would interact with the subatomic particles and give them their mass. The very massive particles would interact a lot with the field, while massless particles wouldn't interact at all. To better understand the idea, we can use the analogy of water and swimmers. In our analogy, the water serves the role of the Higgs field. A barracuda, being supremely streamlined, interacts only slightly with the field and can move through it very easily. The barracuda would then be similar to a low-mass particle. In contrast, my buddy Eddie, no stranger to donuts, can only move very slowly through the water. In our analogy, Eddie is a massive particle made massive by interacting a lot with the water. The lightest of the familiar subatomic particles is the electron, while in the subatomic world, the king of mass is the top quark. It weighs about as much as an entire atom of gold, about 350,000 times more than the electron. I'd like to stress that we believe the top quark is not more massive because it's bigger. It's not. In fact, we believe that both the top quark and the electron are exactly the same size. Indeed, they both have zero size. The top quark is more massive than the electron simply because it interacts more with the Higgs field. Actually, if the Higgs field didn't exist, neither of these particles would have any mass at all. Now, in the press, you don't hear about the Higgs field, but rather the Higgs boson. How are these two things related? The Higgs boson is the smallest bit of the Higgs field. To understand how that works, we should again return to water. Everyone knows what water is. If you're immersed in it, you know that water is everywhere. It's a continuous medium, and there are no holes in it. We also know that water is made of molecules, specifically H2O. If you hold these two ideas in your head with the realization that water consists of countless individual molecules, you can now begin to appreciate the Higgs boson. The Higgs field that gives subatomic particles their mass is made of countless individual Higgs bosons, just like water is made of individual molecules. So um, I really like this video. Um, I had fun making it. In fact, it was quite a while ago that I made it. Um, this video was made in um, July of 2011. This was before the Higgs field was discovered. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention to the fact that um, this video is merely one video of many 
that I have made and you can find on the Fermilab YouTube channel. We have over 100 videos. Uh, they're about the same size, the same level, and they talk about all matters of modern physics. Okay, so now that you know what the Higgs field is, um, the Higgs field, and the Higgs, well, specifically the Higgs boson, was discovered in July of 2012. And, um, well, you know, it was a tremendous triumph of modern physics. It completed the unification of the electromagnetic field and the weak field. So now we know of the single electroweak force. And it was an amazing thing. Now, in state, or the, the Higgs idea and the Higgs discovery would not be possible without two of the most brilliant minds on the planet. Well, actually, I realized that might have been misleading. I, I didn't mean me and, and Peter Higgs. No, this is a picture of, of the two of us. Um, we were at a conference um, in Stockholm uh, in July of 2013, a year after the Higgs boson was discovered. Um, you know, he was there to take a look at the area because, well, you know, it was going to be very soon that he was going to get a phone call from the Swedish Academy. I was there because, well, I wanted to meet Peter Higgs. And you can see he was very, very excited about having a picture taken. Everybody wants to take pictures with him. So, no, actually, the two most brilliant people uh, involved in the Higgs, uh, the invention of the Higgs, are these, these two people, Peter Higgs and Francois Englert. And uh, this is just a few months after the picture I had with Peter Higgs. Um, they won the Nobel Prize in October of 2013 for their work that they did in 1964. So it was nearly 50 years in the making from the prediction of the theory to the validation by experimentalists. It, it took a long time and uh, it was well worth the wait. It was an amazing, amazing thing. So now we have what we might think of as the entire standard model. The standard model is the quarks, the leptons, the forces, and now there is the ghostly field, the Higgs field that permeates the universe and gives mass to all of these particles. And this is essentially our current guess of a theory of everything, which is incredibly, well, it's just impressive to, to have, to realize that humanity has done that much. But I think it's a completely fair question to ask, is the standard model a theory of everything? And the answer is certainly not. And I will talk a lot now about what other things are involved. Um, and this is the point in the talk where I depart from a standard talk like this. In fact, many people give a talk about a theory of everything. They will then perhaps move on and talk about their particular candidate theory of everything. And the one that perhaps is the most familiar is a thing called superstring theory. And there's a lovely book by Brian Greene written on, on the idea. Uh, it's been around for a while now. Superstring theory suggests that at the smallest level, the quarks aren't actually subatomic particles. What they are are little vibrating strings, little sticks of spaghetti or little hula hoops, and the different vibrations, the different notes are the different particles. It's a delightful theory. Um, I kind of hope it's true, but it, there's exactly zero experimental evidence. And that's true of basically all of the theories of everything. We have no evidence for any of them. And so I want to take a very different approach here. I want to tell you not about speculation that nobody has uh, validated yet. I want to give you an idea of what we know, where we're going, and experimentally, how we're going to get there, because I think that is perhaps the right path. So let's start out by talking about the things that the standard model doesn't explain. It doesn't explain why there are quarks, why there are leptons, why there are two types of particles, and not three or four or five. Why are there three carbon copies? That leftmost column of quarks and leptons make up the matter of the universe. Why are there three versions? Why not four? Why just one? We don't know that. Why are there four forces or three forces or however many forces that you um, choose to, to draw that line? Why is there a Higgs field? It is perhaps a, uh, a dark secret of, of modern physics that the Higgs field really doesn't have any fundamental origin. It's a band-aid. The standard model has some ideas where people put together and made it, um, but it did predict that particles were massless and we needed to fix that. And so the Higgs field is a band-aid to the theory. It fixes the problem of massless particles, but it doesn't come from any underlying principles. 
So these are questions that nobody knows the answer to. In addition, the standard model is completely silent on the question of gravity. Um, the gravity is described by Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's described as the bending of space and time, and it's not in the standard model at all. Um, in addition, gravity has not been what we call quantized. There's no theory of gravity at the very smallest scales. So this is another thing that the standard model doesn't explain. So I drew this little graphic that I kind of like, and this is essentially everything we know. So you can see in the yellow side, this is the standard model. You have electricity and magnetism, you have the strong force, the weak force, the combination to electroweak force, that's the standard model. In the pink, we have what we know about gravity. And so the celestial and terrestrial gravity was unified by Newton and then Einstein came along and made general relativity. And so these are how things are connected. This is what we know. And what we think, or what many scientists will tell you is, the future will be that we will then unify the electroweak force and the strong force to make a grand unified theory. We will come up with a theory of quantum gravity, and then we will combine quantum gravity and the grand unified force and make a theory of everything. So this is a simplified idea of, of where we're going. Now I wanna draw your lines, your eye to these dashed lines because these dashed lines are places where we don't know really what's going on. We don't know what's happening. These are projections and guesses. And what I wanna do is give you an idea of just how far away we are from where we are now to the energy scale where we might expect the theory of everything to apply. And to do that, I wanna take an analogy. So let's start out by looking at a common cell. And what, what I wanna do is use the thickness of the cell membrane to tell us, or, or to, to stand in for the, um, our, our current level of knowledge. So if our current level of knowledge is the thickness of a cell membrane, if we project to a theory of everything, we believe that the theory of everything scale is the size of the Earth. And so this is, of course, a huge jump in the scale. It's a quadrillion times. If you take the size, the thickness of a cell membrane, the Earth is a quadrillion times bigger than that. So now think about what we're being asked to do. Suppose we actually do treat the, uh, our current understanding as the cell, and our knowledge is the thickness of the cell membrane. And you could imagine that a really bright person might take the knowledge of the cell membrane and be able to predict things like the nucleus of a cell, mitochondria, cytosomes, and other cell stuff. But if you were trying to take what we knew at this tiny scale and project it to something the size of the Earth, there's a good chance that there are things we wouldn't predict. For instance, we wouldn't know about bunnies and compasses and swords and volcanoes. There's a lot of things between the size of the cell and the size of the earth. And it's very likely that we would just never guess any of these things if we tried to come up with a theory projecting over such a large difference in energy. So now, given that, that it is such a huge jump in energy, what I wanna do is I want to um, show you how I think we're going to make some progress. And what we'll do is by trying to understand some of the mysteries that we don't know answers to now. So let's start with some cosmic mysteries. And perhaps one of the most, uh, maybe not the simplest, but, but a straightforward one to, to describe is we don't understand exactly how galaxies rotate. Now, by that, I don't mean we can't measure them. We can actually measure how fast galaxies rotate very quickly. Um, but if you take our known theories of gravity, and you look at the amount of matter that we see in the galaxies, what we um, can do is we can calculate the speed that stars rot or revolve around the galaxy. And this bottom dashed line here we see is what you expect. So it says that near the center of the galaxy, the stars move at slow speeds. As you go towards the outskirts of the galaxy, the stars orbit in faster and faster speeds. And now when you get to the real outskirts, the real hinterlands of the, the galaxy, then stars start moving more slowly. That's the expectation. 
But what you see here with this yellow and blue data, you see that actually in the outskirts of the galaxy, the stars move really much faster than predicted. So the theory works pretty well in the center of galaxies, not so well in the outskirts of the galaxies. Now we don't have an answer for this, but our current theory says that there exists a kind of matter that we've never seen, that does not emit light, but does experience gravity, and we call this dark matter. And dark matter is supposed to be, from our measurements, five times more prevalent than all of the stars and galaxies and gas of the universe. There's more dark matter than there is ordinary matter. So that's one cosmic mystery. Another cosmic mystery has to do with how the universe is expanding. So we believe that there was um, 14 billion years ago, a Big Bang. And as the universe uh, was created, matter was flung out at very high velocities, but gravity is an attractive force. So we'd expect that gravity would slow the expansion over time. So we would start out with fast expansion and then the speed would get slower and slower. Well, we actually measured this. And in 1998, we had a really surprising observation that the expansion of the universe was not slowing down, it's speeding up. About 5 billion years ago, the slowing down process stopped and the speeding up process started. And we still don't understand that in detail, but we have a really good working theory. And the working theory is that there is a type of energy in the universe called dark energy, which is a repulsive form of gravity, which is pushing the universe apart. So here are two cosmic mysteries, and I wanna give you a sense of what that means about our understanding of everything. So dark, well, ordinary matter, dark matter, and dark energy govern the behavior of the entire cosmos. So if you add up all of the stars and galaxies that we can see with our visible telescopes, it turns out that those are simply half a percent of the matter and energy of the universe. Now, there are types of matter that we can't see with our eye, but we can see with our instruments. For instance, the galaxies are surrounded by hydrogen gas and they glow in other wavelengths, whether it be radio waves or infrared or, uh, or other um, spectra that our eyes can't see. So if you add up all of the matter of the universe made up of things called of atoms, it turns out that we can get about 5% of the matter and energy of the universe. Dark matter, on the other hand, is five times more prevalent compared to ordinary matter. And dark energy is about 70% of the matter and energy of the universe. So here is an important lesson. While I am very, very proud of what we know about um, quarks and leptons and all that, it is 5% of the total matter and energy of the universe. So that means we don't understand 95%. And so that means we very clearly need to solve this before a theory of everything is even a possibility. So that's an important thing. 5% is what the standard model covers. And what that means, when we look at the universe, we have some pieces to the, of the puzzle, but we don't have all of the pieces of the puzzle. We simply don't know everything and we need to fill those in, I think, before our theory of everything is a credible, uh, credible prospect. Now, this is not the only mystery. There's another really interesting mystery. So you've heard of Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. And it's often said that that means that energy equals matter and matter equals energy and energy can be converted into matter. And that's true. But it's more true to say that when energy is converted into matter, it's converted into matter and antimatter in equal quantities. So you take that idea, which we have uh, validated many, many times in our experiments, and then you apply it to the universe as a whole. In the Big Bang, the universe was smaller and hotter and full of energy. When it expanded and cooled, it should have made matter and antimatter in equal quantities. There should be for every proton, there should be an antimatter proton for every electron and the antimatter electron. And yet, when we look at the universe, there is only matter. So where did the antimatter go? And the answer to that is, well, we really don't know. Now we do know something, I mean, we're not completely clueless, but we don't know where the antimatter went. Um, and the scale sort of exemplifies what we thought is that there should have been equal amounts of matter and antimatter. However, from studying the amount of energy we see in the cosmic microwave background and comparing it to the number of galaxies we see, 
what we have determined is that somehow in the very, very early universe, for every three billion antimatter particles, there were three billion and one matter particles. And very early in the universe, the three billions canceled each other out and the one was left over. And that one is the matter that we see. So our stars and galaxies is actually one part in three billion of the original matter and antimatter particles that were made when the Big Bang came into, or the universe came into existence at the Big Bang. So this is another very, very big deal that everything that we see is just one part in three billion, which means we have a real mystery here to solve. And of course, there's one other final question, or there are many, but just one more I wanna talk about, the Big Bang. We don't really understand the Big Bang. We can actually, from our experiments, we can study the behavior of matter back to a tenth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, um, but we can't do before this. So we don't know what started the Big Bang. We don't know if there was a before. There are some really big unexplained questions about this. And so these are another thing that we need to really solve to understand everything. So we go back to my graphic here and we have, uh, I think a more a fair picture. We have the yellow, which is the standard model, the pink, which is general relativity. We have our hopes and goals of the green things where we might have a grand unified theory and a theory of everything. But off to the right-hand side, we have mysteries. And those mysteries have to fit somewhere into this grid. And we don't know how they fit just yet. And so that's the first thing is we have to figure out how these known mysteries fit into the grid. Now, um, back in uh, 2002, Donald Rumsfeld was talking in a, in a very different context. He was talking about things, the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. So the known knowns are the standard model and general relativity. The known unknowns are these things for which we know there's a problem, but we don't have an answer. And then there are the unknown unknowns. So there are, in addition to these blue things, things we know are problems, it is inevitable that we will encounter other things that we don't even know anything about yet. And those two will have to fit somehow in this grid. And so until we can somehow put those things in this grid, we've got a ways to go before we can hope to get to that theory of everything. So this is perhaps a little bit of a bleak outlook and I don't want to do that. I want to tell you it's actually quite interesting because there's a lot of things that we're learning we are moving forward. We're trying to do precisely that by take these, these blue unknowns and fit them into this, this framework of knowledge. And that will help us in our progress forward. So let me talk about some of the things that we're doing. So I wanna start by talking about the Large Hadron Collider. And I do this because this is the research that I work on. Um, the Large Hadron Collider is the world's largest particle accelerator. It uh, is just outside Geneva, Switzerland. And um, it's a ring, this red ring, it is 27 kilometers or about 16 and a half miles in circumference. In it, two beams of protons circulate at near the speed of light and they collide at four points around the ring. Um, these collisions are really impressive. They are um, 10 million times hotter than the center of the sun when these things collide. They um, occur about a billion times per second. The temperatures are 10 times hotter than the center of a supernova, which is of course the explosion of a star that you can see across half of the universe. And these temperatures were not common in the universe since the 10th of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. And down at the bottom, you see a picture of what the tunnel looks like, um, segueing into an engineering diagram. So you can see what the inside of these magnets look like. It's an impressive bit of equipment. Now this is the accelerator. We cannot take data without um, large experiments. Uh, large detectors. There are four, but there are two that are the, the ones that are focusing on the, the highest energy collisions. The bottom one is the compact muon solenoid. This is the one on which I work. So compact sounds like it would be small, um, but compact is relative. It is 50 feet high, 50 feet wide, 70 feet long, it weighs 14,000 tons. It's five stories high. And if you look where that little arrow is, there are two people standing there. This camera, it, it basically, it's a digital camera. You can think of it as, as a camera. And it has 100 million, um, yeah, 
100 megapixels, 100 million pixels in it. And that sounds very impressive until you realize an ordinary cell phone has nearly that many pixels. But will your cell phone take 40 million pictures per second? Because this one certainly will. Now, usually when you have a big particle accelerator, you have two experiments. And the idea is that the two separate groups will keep each other honest and, and provide healthy competition. So in the upper left-hand current corner is the Atlas experiment. The Atlas experiment is actually larger than the uh, compact neon solenoid. It is 70 feet high, 70, 70 feet wide, 140 feet long, weighs about 8,000 tons. And you see, again, these little arrows with little tiny people down there. This is a seven-story tall detector. The two experiments are functionally very similar. They're answering similar questions, but they're different technologies. And um, the idea is that if one experiment makes the wrong choice, then the other experiment will be able to make a good measurement. But the reality is both of these detectors are absolutely astonishing in their capabilities. You'd have to be a researcher to realize just how amazing they are. And just to show you what it looks like, here's a picture of me in front of the compact neon solenoid. I am on the third story of a five-story building. Um, in back of me, you see the detector, it's pulled apart. Um, there's a silver pipe in the middle. That pipe is where the beam enters. Um, the collisions occur in deep inside the red part of the detector. And when we're running, the left part of the detector is pushed in so there are no cracks. So this is the world's highest energy particle accelerator, um, but it's certainly not the only thing that scientists are using to try to study um, the, the mysteries that we, we don't know the answers to. For instance, Fermilab is embarked on a multi-decade project uh, called the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. So what we're going to do is we are going to take a beam, a very intense beam of neutrinos. We will shoot them literally through the Earth. There is no tunnel. They just pass through the Earth because neutrinos interact very, very weakly. They will go 800 miles west, 1,300 kilometers, to a detector that is a mile, about 1.6 kilometers underground. There will be a four huge detectors studying neutrinos. And neutrinos have this very interesting property that they can morph their behavior. There are three kinds of neutrinos. So from Fermilab, we shoot one type of neutrinos. And as they travel from Fermilab to the detector to the west of us, they will change their identity. And so what we will study is we will study neutrinos and antimatter neutrinos and how they change their identity. And the reason that we do that is it may be that neutrinos and antimatter neutrinos act differently. And if they do, then we have a case where matter and antimatter act differently. And so this might be a solution to the question of their why matter exists more than antimatter. So up above, you see the groundbreaking ceremony for, on the Fermilab site. It was uh, about a year before this, uh, um, this lecture was given. So we're just in the beginning phases of this. This uh, facility will start operating perhaps in a decade. It's hard to know exactly, but towards the end of the 2020s. And um, we will maybe have some inkling of why this matter-antimatter asymmetry exists. So this is the beam line. This is a prototype of the Dune detector. Um, this is just a prototype. It's a small version of it. The real one is much, much larger than this. It's about 70 meters, about 200 feet long. It is huge. Um, and uh, this particular prototype is operating um, at our sister laboratory in Europe, and um, it works. And uh, it's going to be very, very interesting. It's going to be an exciting time in neutrino physics. So this is two experiments. Now, there's one experiment that I'm really super excited about. Now, this excited uh, this experiment um, is being done at Fermilab. So the, the experiment is called G minus 2. And what we do is we take subatomic particles called muons. Muons are like heavy electrons. And um, like the electron, the muon has a charge and it has a spin. So you have, if you have a spinning charged object, it makes a magnet. So if you take a magnet and you put it in a magnetic field, it will process like a top. So if it processes like a top, you can measure how long it takes for the precession to occur. And it's very fast. Now, previous measurements of this 
have measured how fast it, the precession occurs. And there have been predictions. Now, these are an incredibly precise measurement and prediction. In both cases, they have 12 digits of accuracy, which is just astonishing. Now, in the, on the top here, I have kind of a cartoon of the theory and the measurement. The circles are where the measurements are. The red lines are the uncertainty in the prediction and the uncertainty in the experimental measurement. And their separation is, represents their distance. And this is all to scale. So what the first thing you can see is that the measurement and the theory don't agree with one another. And furthermore, they disagree more than the uncertainties allow. There's no overlap. So this could mean that the theory is just broken. Or I suppose it could be that the measurement was not correct. So with such an exciting prospect, because if this is true, we're going to have to rewrite the textbooks. So we took the G minus two ring, which you can see here. We took it from the, the laboratory where the previous measurement was done, which is in Long Island, New York, and moved it here to Fermilab, where we have a more powerful muon beam. And we're doing the measurement. We have more muons, and we should be able to make a more precise measurement. The first beam was in 2017. The first result, I say fall of 2020, I put a question mark there because I'm not on that experiment. Um, I just hear that they're getting close. And if it's not fall of 2020, it'll be the spring of 2021. But either way, within just a few months, we will have a new measurement. And if the new measurement um, is it gives in the same place, but with a smaller error bars, then we will be able to say definitively that the data and the predictions disagree and that means the standard model will be broken. We'll have to revisit and rethink and maybe come up with an entirely new theory, or at least an addition to the existing theory. This is very, very exciting because the results are just around the corner. You should keep an eye out for this. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So these are some measurements. In addition, we, uh, the scientific community is looking at dark energy. So the dark energy survey was a five-year experiment. It's now complete. It was looking at far off galaxies and see how fast they're moving because that will tell us how the universe expanded over time. So the dark energy survey um, gave us a lot of information. There is a follow on experiment, the DAISY experiment, and uh, we're going to do that over the next 10 years or so. And then there's a whole bunch of dark matter experiments. Um, Lux is one of them. Lux is some, not something that Fermilab is involved with, but it's a pretty picture, so I put that there. Um, but there are dozens of dark matter experiments trying to understand the dark matter of the universe. So I'd like to sort of recap where we know. This is what we know. We know the standard model. We understand in great detail the behavior of the matter that we're made of. In addition, general relativity explains with pretty good um, fidelity the, the motion of the heavens. But there's a lot of things we don't know. The dark universe, remember, we know 95% of the matter and energy of the universe, we don't know yet. We don't know if the forces will be unified. Perhaps they will, perhaps they will not. Um, it looks like they will. We don't know where the antimatter went, which remember is one part in three billion. That's a ridiculous mystery that has to be solved. And then of course, we don't know the details of the Big Bang. So that's kind of the status. So I'd like to share with you this sort of visual metaphor so this painting actually, in, I should say, was done by my wife, who's responsible for both the art as well as the, the, the metaphor itself. Where we are now is we are studying and, and exploring the foothills of this fantastic mountain range. Our goal is off in the distance. We wanna summit the final peak. We wanna see a theory of everything. And in between are some also large peaks that, that we'd like to summit, um, but they're closer. In between where we are and where we're going, there are valleys, there's crags, there's maybe smaller peaks. There's the unknown, they're hidden by the clouds. Our journey is to go from the well-explored foothills where we now understand everything off to the theory of everything, which is something that, that will be an incredible journey, but we're going to encounter some things that we don't understand hidden there down in the clouds. So let me give you some historical perspective. Unification is a very slow process. 1680, theory of gravity, that's the time of Rembrandt. 
Electromagnetism was unified in 1880, not long after the American Civil War. Electricity and magnetism was unified in the 1970s, 50 years ago. Um, so this was a long time ago. It's, it's not something that happens every day or even every decade. There are ongoing experiments that are looking for clues. The particle accelerators that I am involved with and are using very high energy, and very high precision to see if we can find out new clues about how matter works at these, at these extreme conditions. We're searching for dark matter because dark matter is after all five times as much matter than ordinary matter. And these extraordinary telescopes looking far back and away in time are looking at dark energy, which is a full 70% of the matter and energy of the universe. So these, what we're looking for, these are ongoing. And if you are a young person interested in trying to make a big, you know, big dent in our ignorance, these are places where you could actually do something and, and, and maybe make the discovery of, well, the century. Fermilab, um, where I work, is a leader in a lot of these uh, fronts. The Large Hadron Collider is actually operating in Europe, but Fermilab is the single largest user group in the world on the Large Hadron Collider. We have 100 scientists and more engineers and technicians working on it. We are a big impact on that. Um, Fermilab is working on neutrino experiments. In fact, it is the flagship neutrino laboratory and will be for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. There's a lot to be understood for neutrinos. The G minus two experiment I told you about, hopefully the answer will be in a month or three months or six months, but we will learn something really important. The UDE is an interesting experiment that uh, might show how muons change into electrons and vice versa. In addition, Coop and Daisy, uh, DES and Daisy, these are dark matter experiments, dark energy experiments. And these are just a subset of the experiments that we're working on. So we are very interested in this, this path to a theory of everything. And we're studying things, we're digging through knowledge or data, we are overturning stones of ignorance. So we're trying to get a clue as to what it is, what the next step forward is. There really is basically no, um, no way forward, I don't think, except to do one thing, and it's simply just to keep calm and collect more data. And then hopefully someday, probably centuries, maybe a thousand years from now, we really have an understanding of the theory of everything. And with that, I'd like to thank you for coming. <laughs> And if you'd permit me a moment, I'd like a little bit of shameless promotion here. So we've spent an hour here talking about the theory of everything, and there's only so much I can say in an hour. Um, I also made a course with the great, uh, um, the great courses company, and it is on a theory of everything. It's a 12 hour series of well, 24 lectures, each and a half hour long about the things that we've talked about here and more. It's in much more detail. If you're interested in the theory of everything, I, I recommend it and uh, thank you. And I'd like to entertain some of your questions. So uh, let me ask the, the first question and that, to Don, and that is uh, how is the size of the quark defined? Um, well, how is the size of the quark defined? Well, What we do is um, we, it is the, the physical dimension over which uh, you, know, you have to be able to look at something that small to be able to see it. So there's several answers to that. Um, for instance, if you think about it quantum mechanically, um, they talk about waves, waves and particles. So it is, there, there is the wavelength of particles are very, very small, and that gives you a sense of how far out those waves are. But um, another way to think of this is what wavelength of light you need to be able to resolve a quark. And so we know um, how uh, small a wavelength we can make of, of light or other probe particles using our big accelerators. And what we know is that if we look at these quarks with that wavelength, um, we don't see any evidence that there's something there. So uh, maybe an analogy for protons was, is helpful. Um, 
because at the energy at the size scale that we are, protons seem to have no size. But if you probe to higher and higher energies, you can make wavelengths that are smaller and smaller. And when the wavelength of light is about a quadrillionth of a meter, it starts resolving and seeing that the protons actually have a size. So with the quarks, we um, can make uh, wavelengths 2,000 times smaller than a proton, and we see no evidence of it being resolved. So that's what we're looking at, and we see nothing of a size. Okay, so next question is, since the particles were massless in the beginning, wouldn't that mean that gravity did not affect particles at that time? That's a very good question, and the short answer to that is, um, we don't have a theory of quantum gravity, so we are not really sure what happened early on. Um, it is true, however, and, and this is very hard to get your head around, but in general relativity, um, which is the current theory of gravity, the, the thing that's the most important is not mass, but energy. So um, if general relativity applied at this very small, um, time in the history of the universe, then gravity would have been um, affected by the energy of these particles. And so there's, this is absolutely something that might amaze you. So we know what mass is, or at least we think we do. Mass is the amount of stuff that, that makes up things. But if you um, actually ask, what is the nature of mass? Um, well, we are made of atoms, and if you actually ask how many, what's the mass of the atoms in your body, it's the same mass as you. Um, then you go the next step down, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Well, electrons are very low mass, so you don't have to pay attention to them. If you look up the mass of the protons and neutrons, um, they equal approximately the mass that you have. So we know that protons and neutrons are made of quarks, and so you ask, well, what's the mass of quarks? And it turns out the mass of quarks is only 2% the mass that makes up you and me. So where is the other 98%? It is an amazing thing. So the, the quarks are held inside protons and they're very low mass particles and they're moving at near the speed of light. So they're moving at the speed of light, they have a lot of energy. And of course, if they're moving at the speed of light, it has to be a very strong forces holding them together. And so you have the kinetic energy of their moving, you have the potential energy being held together. And so at the subatomic level, there really isn't things that are mass in the sense that we mean mass. There's only energy. And so when the Higgs field was turned off, there was still a lot of energy. And so assuming that, and we are assuming that, that um, the general relativity works at these small scales, that energy would actually cause some sort of attractive force. But that question is a good one. And it's, it's probing a range that we don't know the answer to. And you'll find that it's very, very easy for people to ask me very good and very sensible questions. And the only answer is, I don't know. Yes. So then um, speaking of, of mass, and uh, does, the, does the Higgs field have a mass? And if not, and how does a massless Higgs field create a massive Higgs boson? Okay, so the Higgs field is, does not have a mass per se. It is just a field. Um, however, Higgs bosons, which are vibrations of the field, do have mass. And so this is the very weirdest thing. So Higgs bosons, which are vibrations of the field, are affected by the field, which sounds kind of sort of circular. Um, but there is an analogy in, in more familiar uh, matter for water molecules are individual molecules floating around inside, you know, a tub of water. But there is a thing called viscosity. And so the water molecules interact with other water molecules. And it's a similar thing. The Higgs bosons interact with the Higgs field. And that's what gives mass to the Higgs bosons. And we are studying this now. We only uh, discovered the Higgs field in 2012. And we are now uh, measuring precisely how the Higgs field interacts with the known particles, the heaviest particles, the top quarks, lighter particles, various bosons, the bottom quarks. In fact, there was a recent measurement only 
uh, I don't know, a month or so ago um, of the Higgs field interacting with very light particles of muons. So we're still getting a handle on how it all hangs together. But the short answer is the Higgs boson interacts with the Higgs field and that's what gives mass to the Higgs bosons. Okay, could there, could there be a fourth generation of elementary particles or could there be infinitely many? That is a fascinating question and that's one I wanna know the answer to. So the short answer is maybe, but we know a lot about this. So let me tell you, if you recall with the, um, I had that little periodic table with the two quarks and then say the up and down quark of the electron and the neutrino. Then I had the next one, Charm and Strange, the muon and the neutrino. So they always come with two quarks, a charged lepton and a neutrino. So back in the early 1990s, a experiment or a set of experiments using an accelerator in Europe, it was called the LEP accelerator, were colliding electrons and antimatter electrons to make a particle called the C boson. It was a fantastic facility. It, it will be a long time before anybody measures the behavior of these Z bosons with more precision. And one of the things is the, the Z bosons decay. They can decay into quarks, they can decay into charged leptons, and they can decay into neutrinos. And one of the first measurements that was made back, I think it was in 1991, was a measurement of how many different types of neutrinos the Z boson can decay into. And the answer is 2.95 plus or minus 0 0.05. And of course, it has to be how many types of neutrinos? Well, it has to be one or two or three or four. So 2.95 plus or minus 0 0.05 is another way of saying three. It can't be two and it can't be four. So what that says is we believe that there are three neutrinos. If there are three neutrinos, then that, and they go in those columns, then there are only three columns. So it seems like there is not a fourth column. If there is a fourth column, then it would have to be a neutrino that is very heavy. And since all the other neutrinos have zero mass or nearly zero mass, not exactly zero mass, then that would mean that we have some other new cool physics going on. So I don't know the answer to your question, but it certainly looks like there are three and only three. And if you ask me why there are three and only three, I don't know, but gosh, I'd like to know. All right, so next question. What would be the best way you would recommend someone with a science background, but not physics background to understand the math of quantum physics? The math of quantum physics? Well, the math of quantum physics is a little challenging. Um, it, it is, you know, I don't know the background of the person uh, speaking, but or, or writing, but the, the math of, of quantum mechanics is at its simplest level, just a little bit higher than calculus. So if you, if you know the mathematics of high school and college, probably take calculus. And then after that, there's a, a more slightly more complicated version of calculus called differential equations. And if you can study up to that point, so it's about a year of college math, you'll understand the mathematics. Um, the problem with with studying the mathematics of quantum mechanics is you'll be able to make really great predictions, but you're still gonna scratch your head over what the heck is going on. But you will be in good company. After all, um, professional scientists have been trying to figure out exactly what's going on in quantum mechanics for 100 years. Um, so the math is, is easier. The next step of what does the math mean, that, that, that's really pretty tricky. So, um, next one is, um, gravity is the curvature of space-time according to the theory of relativity, relativity. So how do, can we consider it a force? This is a very good and very common question. Um, and the answer is, it is at some level heretical. Um, however, at the quantum level, the theory of general relativity is not correct and we know it's not correct. So why do I say that? Well, because if we take general relativity and we apply those equations to the world of, of the microscopic, of the quantum world, what pops out are infinities. And when your mathematics pops out infinities, it basically means that the mathematic is broken and it just doesn't work. So we do not have a good theory of quantum mechanics, and this is to be admitted, but we know that general relativity is an approximate theory 
at large scales. So where large scales doesn't have to be very large, it could be you know, the size of a marble or something like that. Um, but at very small scales, it breaks. So we are predicting that what will happen at the quantum scale is kind of what happens with the other forces. But we don't know that to be true. What we all we know is that general relativity breaks at the small scales. And anything beyond that is an informed guess. Okay, now you raised my own question. Maybe even though I'm not a physicist, you said uh, we don't have a good theory of quantum mechanics. Did, did you mean a good quantum gravity? I'm sorry. I, okay. if I said, well, if I said quantum mechanics, I'm wrong. No, we have, we, quantum mechanics, we at least understand very precisely. We can make very good measurements. In fact, Fermilab is now becoming a, uh, a, a quantum mechanics powerhouse. Um, but no, I did mean we do not have a good theory of quantum gravity. Okay, some of those articles totally I read eluded us. Help me. <laughs> yes, so my apologies if I misspoke. Okay, so uh, does the does the Higgs field interact with dark energy? We don't know. Um, absolutely no clue. We have no measurements, no idea. Um, I. The, the dark energy does not seem to have any mass. And so it may, if it interacts with the Higgs field, I think it's some sort of indirect thing, but it, the Higgs field certainly doesn't interact with dark energy in the same way that it interacts with matter. Um, but there, we, we don't know. Okay, so our, are neutrinos the components of dark matter since it interacts with ordinary matter very rarely? Uh, so that's a very interesting question. So we talk about dark matter. We talk about dark matter in a sort of a simple way. We say that there is one form of dark matter, but the reality is that there are actually multiple forms of dark matter. Neutrinos are a form of dark matter. There is almost as much matter in the universe um, in dark matter, I'm sorry, in neutrinos as there are stars. Not quite, but almost. Um, there are other forms of dark matter. There are black holes and things that we can't see. Um, but if you add up all of that types of dark matter, these little ones, they only are a very tiny, tiny fraction of the matter in, in, that we see in the universe. The dark matter that when we say dark matter, we're talking about the dominant form of dark matter, which is five times more prevalent than ordinary matter. Things like neutrinos and black holes and so forth are tiny, tiny, tiny contributions of the dark matter mystery. Um, so you have to be a little careful. If you dig a little deeper, you find there are all these little tiny bits, but we don't understand the big thing. It's like, you know, we understand a few mice, but we're really trying to understand the elephant. Okay, so how, how can the LHC sustain the temperature of a trillion degrees Celsius? Okay, so this is really cool. Um, and, and I get this question a lot because it's, it's true. If you, you take a proton at the LHC and smash it together with another proton, it is a ridiculous temperature. And so that sounds like, oh my gosh, it should melt everything. But when you take two protons and you smash them together, the energy is also equivalent to two mosquitoes coming head on and bonking into one another. So this doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. I tell you it's two mosquitoes, which nobody cares about. I tell you it's you know, much, much hotter than the center of the sun. Both are true because what's happening is that energy of two mosquitoes bonking into one another is in a tiny, tiny, tiny volume. So in that microscopic, itsy bitsy volume, the temperatures are outrageously hot, but they, it's still a small volume. It's like, you know, you can talk about um, a burning match and a cup of very hot water. There's more energy in a cup of hot water than there is in the burning match, but the burning match is hotter. And this is the same thing. The, the collisions are tiny and in those tiny collisions, the energies are outrageous. That's cool. So, uh... How was it determined that the ratio of the matter versus antimatter in the early universe was 3 billion to 3 billion and 1? So the way this is done is you have to sort of use your models. And so what we think is that um, 
in the very, very early universe, matter and antimatter were made in equal quantities. Um, but there was some, some probably quantum mechanical effect that we do not understand properly that made matter slightly more prevalent than antimatter. So if it's true that this thinking that there was, you know, we don't know the number yet. I'm going to say 3 billion, but, but the, before we do that, we don't know the number. But there's 3 billion and 3 billion and 1. So whatever those 3 billions-ish numbers, they, those matter and antimatter would annihilate and return back to being energy. That energy heats up the universe. And so as the universe expanded and cooled, that residual energy of the annihilation of matter and antimatter um, made the early universe a hot plasma or a gas. And so then it expanded and cooled off. So we now can look back in time and look at what we call the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the energy and the temperature of the universe about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. But that cosmic microwave background radiation is the cooled down version of the energy that was released when the matter and antimatter combined. And so if you take our models and take those ideas, you can look at the amount of energy in the cosmic microwave background radiation. You can look out and see how many protons we have in all of the galaxies that we have, and you get the ratio of about 3 billion to 1 using that kind of thinking. So that's where the numbers come from. And uh, um, so, so it's not guesswork. It's actually a very impressive bit of scientific deduction. Okay, so we have many, many good questions still, but I'm, I'm only gonna have time for, for two more. So um, is a theory of everything really needed? <laughs> you know, that is a really wonderful question. Is a theory of everything needed? Well, I mean, if, you know, the your pressing thing in your life is to figure out some socks for tomorrow. No, of course not. But when you when you look at the history of, of humanity, the history of questions that have bothered humanity since the very beginning of writings, these are the questions that we ask. We ask, how did we get to be here? Mankind is intrinsically an inquisitive species. We want to know what our place is in the universe. We want to know where we came from. We want to know if we are inevitable or if we are a cosmic accident. We want to understand why we're here. And the only way that we will get a really good quantifiable answer on that is to find a theory of everything. So there will always be, I think, you know, as long as there is humanity, there will be a subset of people who are, who are just passionate about trying to answer such questions. And hopefully many of them will go on to be scientists. Right, the last question is, is quite related and it says, if we finally figure out the theory of everything, what can we do with that knowledge? Well, I could take a break, you know, maybe a vacation or something. Um, I, you know, theory of everything, I, it's hard to know what we will be able to, to do with that. Um, but I think looking at the, the end goal of a theory of everything actually is um, perhaps premature because I hope to convince you, or I hope that I did convince you, that we have a long ways to go. And as we work our way towards finding a theory of everything, we will find useful things along the way. I mean, if you asked me 120 years ago, I wouldn't have known about uh, details of, of chemistry and how atoms work. But now by understanding atoms, we can make lasers, we can make all sorts of incredible technological things. In addition, uh, understanding the nucleus, but now we have nuclear power, we have nuclear chemistry, we have um, nuclear uh, um, ways of, of, of medical procedures and so forth to help people. Um, on the way to understanding a theory of everything, we're going to learn a tremendous about, about the universe. And what we will be able to do with that, we won't know until we get there and figure it out. But we always have found something useful to do with it. Okay, thank you very much for your, your uh, lecture and questions, uh, Don, answers. And uh, those of you who are not uh, followers of Don's videos, uh, 
let you should know that he also answers he's been answering a lot of questions from viewers uh, at the ends of each video that, that he's been putting out each week lately during during COVID. so please go ahead and uh, and and follow those and you have any other final comments don no well i'd like to thank everybody for coming i would like to invite people to the fermilab youtube channel um, I do have the ability to chat with a, a few people and answer their questions there. So if there are questions that were not answered here, maybe you can put them there and they might be selected. And uh, um, I just want to thank all of you for coming and, and being interested in science. I mean, I'm passionate about it. The people here at Fermilab all are devoting their lives to it. And I'm gratified that there are people out there who are interested in the same things that drive us day to day to, to get out of bed and try to understand the mysteries of the universe. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we will end the meeting now.